got you there with Sean Delaney. Got- hey guys, it's Sean, and on today's episode, I'm doing one of my once a month deep dives called the distillery. And this distillation is on the legendary basketball coach Phil Jackson. Now, most of you are probably familiar with Coach Jackson because of his time with the Chicago Bulls during the Michael Jordan era or his time with the Los Angeles Lakers during the Kobe and Shaq era. And Phil is a really interesting guy. And we're going to get into that in this distillery. And remember, the the distillery is a once a month deep dive on someone whose thinking and mindsets have really impacted me. And I just dive extremely deep on them. So remember, we release this once a month. So you can head to whatgotyouthere.com. You can sign up for our Momentum Monday newsletter. So you receive this to your inbox because I'm just going to cover a short little bit of this distillery. And you can see our past distillations of people like Josh Waitzkin, Nick Kikonis, uh, Bruce Lee, and others, where they're usually around 10,000 words. So it's a very extensive deep dive. It really gives you a great encapsulation of the person we're going into. And so if you're interested in that, you can head to walkoutyouthere.com. Also, if you're listening to this, you can also watch the video at our YouTube page. Um, just go to YouTube, look at What Got You There podcast, and that'll pop right up. So let's dive into this, this distillation of Phil Jackson. Got to there with Sean Delaney. Got to there, got to there with Sean Delaney. Got so Phil is, he's a champion. He's a nonconformist. He's a lifelong learner. He's a maverick. He's a cultivator, a talent, a leader, and an explorer of the unknown. So I really covered the, the mindsets, the, the leadership lessons, and the against the grain strategies that, that Phil used to become one of the greatest coaches of all time. And I, I really hope you guys can open up your mind to exploring Phil's different modes of thinking, because there, there's no arguing what he did may be considered different but it worked extremely well for him. And, and when I think about a prototypical coach, or probably the majority of us do, right? We, th- we think about one of those, those hard-nosed, almost draconian type leaders, right? Like, this is my way, you follow my way. And Phil is the opposite of that. He's, he's also known as the Zen master, uh, largely because of his Eastern influences and study of Zen and Buddhism and things like that. But he really takes these, these outside approaches to dominate and master his craft. And he's continually evolving to get better at his craft. And, and he actually holds the record for the most NBA championships of all time. He had, he had two as a, as a player with the New York Knicks. Then he had six with the Chicago Bulls. And then he had five with the Los Angeles Lakers. And what I respect so much about Phil is he really carved his own path. And I think this is quintessential to any of the greatest coaches, right? Like think about any of them, Bill Belichick, John Wooden, Pete Carroll, Nick Saban, Steve Kerr, Go on, go on. They all have vastly different coaching styles, but one thing is consistent amongst them all. They are all true to themselves. Think about it, right? Like Bill Belichick on the sideline, sweatshirt cut, kind of looking like a bum. And he just is him. That is him. And then you can look at Nick Saban, more button up, hard nose, competing, 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 much like Pete Carroll. They're all just relentlessly themselves. And that comes up again and again amongst the high performers, the the elite, the true achievers of excellence. They are themselves because almost by definition, you can't be your best self unless you're unleashing your greatest self. And we're all unique there. And so Phil's done a lot of unique things. Uh, We'll we'll talk slightly about them, even his his LSD trip, which he thinks opened his mind up to basketball, Uh, his Zen meditation. And then in in the written form, I'll, I'll talk more about his relationship with Michael Jordan. But what we're going to do here is we're going to cover a bit of his journey. We're going to talk about his 11 principles of leadership. We'll get into his Zen mind and his thinking there, how to develop a winning system, uh, some of the other mindfulness techniques he uses in the mind games he plays with his players, and then the journey of self-discovery, both of himself and also his players. You'll, You'll find out that's something he tries to do. These are individual processes for each one of his players. So I I, I was kind of going back through this entire distillery, and and there were 11 big lessons I think you'll learn here. And we'll dive further into these, but they are quiet the mind. And a quiet mind builds awareness and allows you to be poised and in control in any situation you enter. Another thing is embrace the unknown and carve your own path. The The path is for your steps alone. The third thing is never stop learning and exploring new ways of thinking. You you hear this again and again, right? Like you need to be a lifelong learner. The next is give up control and foster an environment that allows for individual expression. Rules reduce freedom and responsibility. Next up is create a sense of oneness with the group. When a player surrenders his self-interest for the greater good, his fullest gifts as an athlete are manifested. Next is the key to uh, success is compassion and love. Number seven is being the present moment in basketball as in life. 
true joy comes from being fully present in each and every moment, right? Like the only moments we have in life are this one. The next up is break free of mental conditioning and discover your true nature. This, this was key for, for Phil throughout his life. He had so much mental conditioning early, much like all of us do. And he had to get rid of that. The next up is the system you design gives you the output it's designed for. So Phil talks about designing a beautiful system. Next is transparency is key. So you need to define people's roles clearly and the best leaders do that. And then number 11, if you have the right mindset, you can make any crisis or loss work for you. So we're, we're going to dive into, into Phil's 11 mindful leadership principles here in a second. But a quote I wanted to read you from Phil's is, for me, basketball is an expression of life, a single, sometimes glittering thread that reflects the whole. Life, like basketball, is messy and unpredictable. It has its way with you, no matter how hard you try to control it. The trick is to experience each moment with a clear mind and an open heart. When you do that, the game in life will take care of itself. I just enjoy that philosophy. We, we think so many coaches, uh, there, there aren't open to the, the messiness and the unpredictable nature, but we have to realize coaching just like life is going to be messy. It's going to be unpredictable. So I just enjoy that one. Wanted to share that with you. All right. So let's dive into these 11 mindful leadership principles and, and the basic principles of mindful leadership that Phil's evolved over the years, uh, really help him transform disorganized teams into champions. And that was a consistent theme, uh, especially in pro sports uh, amongst all teams, but the disorganization, right? Like you have egos, you have all these different personalities and players. So Phil says, you won't find any lofty management theories here with leadership as within most things in life. The best approach is always the simplest. So number one of his 11 mindful leadership principles, number one, lead from the inside out. Eventually, and I'm going to be reading a lot from Phil's words here. Uh, so when I'm saying things like I, that's just Phil speaking. So eventually I arrived at the synthesis that felt authentic to me. And this is similar to, to John Wooden developing his winning philosophy. Wooden did not design his leadership and coaching philosophy until 16 years after he got into coaching. And what ended up happening, I think it was that he won the next 12 uh, championships over the next like 18 years or something like that. And so Phil says, and, and though at first I worried that my players might find my unorthodox views a little wacky, time went by. I discovered that the more I spoke from the heart, the more the players could hear me and benefit from what I'd gleaned. Remember, all journeys in life are in error. So the next one up is bench the ego. And Phil says, I discovered that the more I tried to exert power directly, the less powerful I became. That's very Lao Tzu and Dao Te Ching. And he learned to dial back my ego and distribute power as widely as possible without surrendering final authority. Paradoxically, this approach strengthened my effectiveness because it freed me to focus on my job as keeper of the team's vision. Some coaches insist on having the last word, but I always tried to foster an environment in which everyone played a leadership role from the most unschooled rookie to the veteran superstar. If your primary objective is to bring the team into a state of harmony and oneness, it doesn't make sense for you to rigidly impose your authority. Number three, let each player discover his own destiny. One thing I've learned as a coach is that you can't force your will on people. If you want them to act differently, you need to inspire them to change themselves. I've always been interested in getting players to think for themselves so that they can make difficult decisions in the heat of the battle. Michael Jordan used to call that the team's collective think power. My approach has always been to relate to each player as a whole person, not just as a cog in the basketball machine. That meant pushing him to discover what distinct qualities he could bring to the game beyond taking shots and making passes. I, I would inspire questions like how much courage did he have or resilience? And what about courage under fire? The fourth one is the road to freedom is a beautiful system. When I joined the Bulls in 1987 as an assistant coach, my colleague Tex Winter taught me a system known as the triangle offense that aligned perfectly with the values of selflessness and mindful awareness I've been studying in Zen Buddhism. What attracted me to the triangle was the way it empowers the players, offering each one a vital role to play as well as a high level of creativity within a well-defined structure. That's so amazing, right? Like a beautiful system, the output of that system is, is going to give us what we want. So if you design the system correctly, you'll get the right outputs. But I also love how he hits on again and again. We have to empower the individual, which leads to a greater collective whole. Um, and, and he really does that from the, the lowest player on the totem pole to the highest one up. So I just, I just really enjoy that articulation and his thought around designing a beautiful system. Next up is turn the mundane into the sacred. 
And as I see it, my job as a coach was to make something meaningful out of one of the most mundane activities on the planet, playing pro basketball. Despite all the glamour surrounding the sport, the process of playing day to day in one city after another can be a soul numbing exercise. And so that's actually why Phil started incorporating meditation into practices. He wanted to give players something besides the X's and O's to focus on. And he actually invented a lot of rituals to infuse practices with a sense of the sacredness. And he says, we used to perform a ritual that he borrowed from the great Vince Lombardi, the legendary football coach of the Green Bay Packers. And the players formed a, a row on the baseline. And, he, and Phil says, I'd ask them to commit to being coached that season saying, God has ordained me to coach you young men. And I embrace the role I've been given. If you would wish to accept the game I embrace and follow my coaching as a sign of your commitment, step across the line. And he says, the essence of coaching is to get the players to wholeheartedly agree to being coached and then offer them a sense of their destiny as a team. Remember, like any great leader, you have to create a compelling vision and a sense of hope that that vision is essential and achievable. The six one up is one breath equals one mind. And to get the players to settle down, I introduced them to one of the tools I would use successfully with the Bulls. And this was mindfulness meditation. And through mindfulness meditation, it, it does have its roots in Buddhism. But Phil found it easily accessible technique for quieting the restless mind and focusing attention on whatever is happening in the present moment. This is extremely useful for basketball players who often have to make those split second decisions under enormous amounts of pressure. And Phil also discovered that when he had the players sit in silence, breathing together in sync, it helped align them on a nonverbal level far more effectively than words. And so one breath equals one mind, right? It's like that collective think that Michael Jordan was talking about. And he says, another aspect of Buddhist teaching that has influenced me is the emphasis on openness and freedom. The Zen teacher, Shunru Suzuki, likened the mind to a cow in a pasture. If you close the cow in a small, small yard, it will become nervous and frustrated and start eating the neighbor's grass. But if you give it a large pasture to roam around in, it will be more content, more content and less likely to break loose. And Phil says, I've also found that Suzuki's metaphor can be applied to managing a team. If you place too many restrictions on players, they'll spend an inordinate amount of time trying to buck the system. Like all of us, they need a certain degree of structure in their lives, but they also require enough latitude to express themselves creatively. So you got to create structure so you can have freedom, create your weather so you can blow in the wind, map your direction so you can swerve in the lanes, clean up so you can get dirty, choreograph, then dance, learn to read and write before you start making up words, check if the pool has water in it before you dive in, learn to sail before you fly. I, I love that section. Uh, I, I go. Um, but I just thought that was a really great uh, part of the and so number seven, the key to success is compassion. And so in, in the, the new uh, adaptation of the Chinese sacred text, the Tao Te Ching by Stephen Mitchell, he offers a, a provocative take on Lao Tzu's approach to leadership. And he says, I have just three things to teach, simplicity, patience, compassion. And these three are the greatest tr treasures. So simple, in actions and thoughts, you return to the source of being. Patient with both friends and enemies, you accord with the way things actually are not how you hope they are, and then compassionate towards yourself. You, recon you reconcile all beings in the world. Compassion has been the most important part. I think it's essential for athletes to learn to open their hearts so they can collaborate with one another in a meaningful way. Next up is number eight, and it's keep your eye on the spirit, not on the scorecard. And management guru Stephen Covey tells this old Japanese tale about a samurai warrior and his three sons. And the samurai wanted to teach his sons about the power of teamwork. So he gave each one of them an arrowhead and asked them to break it. No problem. Each son did it easily. And then the samurai gave them a bundle, the three arrows bound together and asked them to repeat the process. But none of them could. That's your lesson, the samurai said. If you, if you three stick together, you will never be defeated. And so when a player isn't forcing a shot or trying to impose his personality on the team, his gifts as an athlete most fully manifest. Paradoxically, by playing within his natural abilities, he achieves a higher potential for the team that transcends his own limitations and helps his teammates transcend theirs. When this happens, the whole begins to add up to more than the sum of its parts. And so most coaches get tied up in knots, worrying about tactics, but Phil prefers to focus his attention on whether the players were moving toward together in a spirited way. And he says, my confidence grew out of knowing that when the spirit was right and the players were attuned to one another, 
the game was likely to unfold in our favor. So many people care about just the X's and O's, but being a part of some elite sports teams, th there's something deeper there. And so I've been on teams where we did not have the most talented players, the most talented X's and O's. But when we were all together as one, working as a collective unit, we could beat those teams that, had, that looked much better on paper. And I just thought this was a really important part, uh, especially for a lot of the coaches and athletes out there. So next up, number nine, sometimes you have to pull out the big stick. And in the strictest form of Zen meditation, uh, the monitor roams around the meditation hall, striking sleepless or, or uh, lifeless meditators with a flat wooden stick. And so it's to get them to pay attention. And this is not uh, as an act of punishment, but just to get them to liven up, to pay attention. And Phil said, once I had the Bulls practice um, in silence to, to waken them up to the importance of what's going on, right? This was like him striking them with the stick. And he said, on another occasion, I made them scrimmage with the lights out. Imagine that. Imagine an entire basketball scrimmage with the lights out. And Phil says he likes to shake things up. And he always has his players continuing to guess what's coming next because... Life is unknown. And so when you can do that, you get people more accustomed to that. I think about this. This is very similar to someone else we featured on the distillery, and that's Josh Waitzkin, the le legendary chess player, martial artist, um, and just masterful learner. He's the author of the, the book, The Art of Learning, which I loved. And, and Waitzkin has this principle, being at peace in the chaos, because ultimately, we don't want to be meditating in a flower garden, right? We want to be able to meditate and have a meditative state throughout our lives in the chaos of life, because that's what we're going to experience most of the time. And so Phil Jackson actually had some uh, advice to, to Luke Walton. So Luke Walton coaching the NBA now, but he used to play for Jackson on the Lakers. And he says, I know you're thinking about becoming a coach someday. I think that's a good idea, but coaching isn't all about fun and games. Sometimes, no matter how nice of a guy you are, you're going to have to be an asshole. You can't be a coach if you need to be liked. And Phil realizes that there are certain things he's going to do to get players out of their comfort zone that they're not going to like. And maybe they can look back 10, 15 years down the road and respect what Phil did to get the betterment out of themselves. So I enjoyed that. Next up, number 10, when in doubt, do nothing. At type A type personalities, coaches, this is one of the hardest things. You know, leaders of organizations, this is very hard to do. But Phil says basketball is an action sport. Most people involved in it are high energy individuals who love to do something, anything to solve problems. However, there are occasions when the best solution is to do absolutely nothing. On a deeper level, I believe that focusing on something other than the business at hand can be the most effective way to solve complex problems. When the mind is allowed to relax, inspiration also follows. The unconscious mind is a terrific solver of complex problems when the conscious mind is busy elsewhere or perhaps better yet, not overtaxed at all. And so remember, it's, it's like those shower thoughts, right? When you tap into your unconscious, you do your best thinking, you have those aha moments only when you're tapping into the un unconscious and you need rest, you need recovery, you need relaxation and stepping away from the chaos in order for that to happen. So the 11th principle is forget the ring. So Phil says, and yet as a coach, I know that being fixated on winning or my, more likely not losing is counterproductive, especially when it causes you to lose control of your emotions. What's more, obsessing about winning is a loser's game. The most we can hope for is to create the best possible conditions for success, then let go of the outcome. The ride is a lot more fun that way. I have to repeat this line. I think this is one of the most important lines in this entire distillation. He says, the most we can hope for is to create the best possible conditions for success, then let go of the outcome. The ride is a lot more fun that way. And so Phil actually says, that's why at the start of every season, I always encourage players to focus on the journey rather than the goal. What matters most is playing the game the right way and having the courage to grow as human beings as well as basketball players. When you do that, the ring takes care of itself. So those are 11 uh, mindfulness leadership principles by Phil. Uh, we're, I'm going to get more now into actually like becoming of Phil and, and what that looked like because we're all on these, these growth journeys throughout our entire lives. And so Phil says, he goes, things didn't work out like I planned, but they work out, worked out like I hoped. I love that line. So Phil, he, he's fiercely independent, he's individualistic, and he also loved and craved being part of a group. And it was kind of this unique combination, right? Like being alone by himself, but also that inclusiveness, that part of the whole that really made his journey towards excellence really interesting. And he, he embraced and studied and tried to learn from a ton of alternative thinkers, including writers like uh, Carlos Castaneda, Lao Tzu, uh, the Lako Lakota Sioux, Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, and many others. And actually, when he was still playing with, with the, the Knicks, and even when he was in college, his pursuit left his teammates with the notion that he loved knowledge more than he loved the game. 
But actually, this wide breadth of knowledge provided the foundation for his approach to coaching. And, and Jackson was consumed with new ideas. And in turn, they fed his awareness of his unfolding intuitive nature. And Jackson was just constantly discovering his intuition as a child discovers walking. He was obsessed with exploring his own mind. And we talk about exploring his own mind. He, he's talked a lot about a peak experience. And so this was in May, 1973, just days after uh, the New York Knickerbockers defeated LA for uh, four games to one in the, in the NBA championship. And so what he ended up doing was he ate LSD for breakfast. And some of the things he says is out of this LSD trip came an enhanced love for the game of basketball and a new appreciation of team play. He says, I had to rediscover my ego in order to lose it. I was able to become totally team-oriented player for the first time. It was as if his team intuition had flowered into a, this sixth sense about the connectedness of basketball, a sixth sense that he would trust again and again over the years. And so he would prove himself um, as a psychologist, a master of group dynamics and the enhancer of athletic performance. And one of the many things that separated him from other coaches is that he preferred to heap pressure on opponents as opposed to his own players. I just found that part really interesting. And so, and so it's interesting, right? Like whether, whether you're open to exploring things like an LSD trip or not, I have, I have no issue with that. I'm just saying he, he did things that opened up his mind. And I'm saying, let's all open up our minds. It doesn't have to be through a peak experience of LSD, but just be open to new ways of thinking, new ways of growing, new ways of developing. I think that's just essential on all of our own journeys of self-discovery. And so, like I mentioned at the outset of this, Phil's journey of self-discovery was just filled with uncertainty, but it, it was always alive with promise. He always had this hope, and that actually came from a childhood experience he had. So Phil had a ton uh, of weird and curious health issues as a child, and he, he grew up a really, in a really interesting household. Uh, I'm pretty sure both of his parents were pastors and extremely religious, extremely strict. They didn't even allow him to go to a school dance. The first dance he went to was in college. So expression like dance was never allowed. And, and so he talks about this, this issue he had with his health when he was a child and how it kind of opened his eyes. So this one will be a little bit longer, but I thought this was really important. And he says, one night I was sleep sleeping when all of a sudden I heard a roar, like the sound of a railroad train building and building until it grew so loud that I thought the train was going to burst into my bedroom. This sensation was completely overpowering, but for some reason, I wasn't frightened. As the noise kept getting louder, I felt a powerful surge of energy radiating through my body that was much stronger and more all-consuming than anything I'd ever experienced before. I don't know where this power came from, but I awoke the next day feeling strong and confident and brimming with energy. The fever was gone, and after that, my health improved dramatically, and I rarely got colds or flus. However, the primary impact of this spontaneous experience was psychological, not physical. After that night, I had a greater belief in myself and a quiet faith that everything was going to work out for the best. I also seemed to be able to tap into a new source of energy within myself that I hadn't sensed before. From that point on, I felt confident enough to throw my whole mind, body, and soul into what I loved. And that, as much as anything, has been the secret of my success in sports. Wow, talk about like an illuminating moment in time at a young age just to open your mind up to self-empowerment and the belief of what's possible. And I just thought this was so key because you can see he embraces the unknown because he has this inner belief, this inner knowing that he can keep trying and can experiment and things aren't necessarily going to work out exactly as we hope, but we're going to get closer to becoming who we can become. And he says, I've always wondered where that power came from and whether I could learn how to tap into it on my own, not just on the basketball court, but in the rest of my life. And it was true, right? Like Phil just kept exploring, exploring. And he set out on his own journey of self-discovery. He said, I don't know where I was going or what pitfalls I might stumble upon along the way, but I was encouraged by these longs from the grateful dead song, Ripple. There is a road, no simple highway between the dawn and dark of night. And if you go, no one may follow the path is for your steps alone. That's an awesome line. I just love that as well, Phil. So great call with that Grateful Dead song. Uh, it makes me think of the Joseph Campbell line. If you can see your path laid out in front of you, step by step, you know it's not your path. Your path, you make with every step you take. That's why it's your path. So I hope everyone in life will explore this thinking. We're all each on our own journey and following our own path. And we don't necessarily know where that path's gonna lead, but trust in your gut and your instincts and your inner knowing 
that if you continue on that path, you're going to end up sim- you're going to end up somewhere in life better um, than where you might ever even end up hoping. And so we talked a little bit about Phil's overall concepts around Zen mind, beginner's mind, and he he really got interested in Zen. Um, since he read Shunru Suzuki's classic Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And Suzuki was a Japanese teacher who played a key role in bringing Zen Buddhism to the West and talked a, a learning approach to each moment with a curious mind that is free of judgment, right? Like explore each moment as an unknown and be curious about it. And Suzuki says, if your mind is empty, it is always ready for anything. It is open to everything. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert mind, there are a few. And so Phil says what appealed to him about Zen practice was just its simplicity. And Buddhism is about seeing. It's about knowing rather than believing or hoping or wishing. It's also about not being afraid to examine anything and everything, including your own personal agendas, right? This is all about inner self-work. If you look enough at Phil's progress and evolution, it was all an inner game, as I think all of this life should be. It's about exploring our innermost being. And Phil says, I discovered the more aware I became of what was going on inside of me, the more connected I became to the outside world. I became more patient with others and calmer under pressure, qualities that helped me immensely when I became a coach. So I'm going to read a line here from Phil that I thought was just really interesting and good. And he says, in basketball, as in life, true joy comes from being fully present in each and every moment, not just when things are going your way. Of course, it's no accident that things are more likely to go your way when you stop worrying about whether you're going to win or lose and focus your full attention on what's happening right in this moment. The day I took over the Bulls, I vowed to create an environment based on the principles of selflessness and compassion I learned as a Christian in my parents' home, sitting on a cushion, practicing Zen, and studying the techniques of the Lakota Sioux. I knew that the only way to win consistently was to give everybody from the stars to the number 12 player on the bench, a vital role on the team and inspire them to be acutely aware of what was happening, even when the spotlight was on somebody else. More than anything, I wanted to build a team that would blend individual talent with a heightened group consciousness, a team that could win big without becoming small in the process. This is so crucial. The best leaders instill and inspire each individual person on that team, in that organization, a purpose, a mission, a reason what they're doing, right? And he says it can be the all-star or the 12th person on the bench. Each one of those people has to know what their individual thing is that they're doing and that there is value and importance on that. I just thought that is such an important part for any leader, any coach to make sure you are looking at that of each individual person and understanding their purpose and their part of the role or their role in the team organization. And so... I get into this a lot deeper in the actual written distillation, but Phil talked about developing a great system. And he says the keys are to teach how to execute the fundamentals, focus on the details, depersonalize criticism, create a learning organization, design a beautiful system from the start. It must be reliable and there has to be a clear purpose. Everyone must become a teacher of the system. It's all about a, a oneness and a bond, right? Like really creating a group, an inclusive wholeness to the one. And Phil also says, basketball is a great mystery. You can do everything right. You can have the perfect mix of talent and the best system of offense in the game. You can devise a foolproof defensive strategy and prepare your players for every possible eventuality. But if the players don't have a sense of oneness as a group, your efforts won't pay off. And the bond that unites the team can be so fragile, so elusive. And so Phil also goes on to say, oneness is not something you can turn on with a switch. You need to create the right environment for it to grow and nurture it carefully every day. And one of the the ways he does this and thinks about it, and I'm sure a lot of these prototypical type coaches might hear this and just kind of dismiss it, but just listen for a minute. And so he talks about the circle of love and he says, after more than 40 years involved in the game at the highest level, both as a player and as a coach, I can't think of a truer phrase to describe the mysterious alchemy that joins players together and unites them in the pursuit of the impossible. And that's the saying and thinking the circle of love. And it takes a number of critical factors to win an NBA championship, including the right mix of talent, creativity, intelligence, toughness, and of course, luck. But if a team doesn't have the most essential ingredient love, none of these other factors matter. The reason I think this is so important is because Phil Jackson is arguably the greatest coach in basketball history. And he says this is the most important component. So no matter what, I think we just need to 
to listen up there and study that a bit further, right? I'm sure we've all been part of teams, groups, organizations where everyone's at constant tension, no matter how talented that group is. If there isn't that connectedness, that, that sense of purpose, that willingness to work and sacrifice for the others, then you, you're just not going to get the most, right? Like going to work every day, going to practice is going to be drudgery. You're going to hate it. But when you love those people around you, when you feel deeply connected, that is when you have this inner inspiration you can't explain where your best self comes to come out. Um, and Phil goes on to say, when a player surrenders his self-interest for the greater good, his fullest gifts as an athlete are manifested. He's not trying to force a shot or do something that's not in his repertoire of basketball moves or impose his personality on the team. It's funny. By playing within his natural abilities, he activates a higher potential beyond his abilities, a higher potential for the team. It changes things for everybody. All of a sudden, the rest of the team can react instinctively to what that player is doing. And it just kind of mushrooms out from there. The whole begins to add up to more than the sum of its parts. Uh, I just love that. And Phil dives into this, or I, sorry, I dive into this further in the written distillation, if, you, if you're curious about that. But Phil talks again and again about fostering an environment for individual expressions. And he, <clears throat> he learned a lot of this from, from uh, Coral Rogers, uh, the author, psychologist. And he says the key, he believed, was for the therapist to create a relationship with the client focused not on solving a problem, but on nurturing personal growth, right? Like this keeps getting hit on again and again. This is all about inner games, right? Personal growth. And the paradox he writes in his seminal work, and this is Car Car Carl Rogers' seminal work on becoming a person. And the quote is, is that the more I am simply willing to be myself in all this complexity of life, and the more I'm willing to understand and accept the realities in myself and in the other person, the more change seems to be stirred up. And so many coaches think and seem to tell their players, I'll do the thinking. You don't have to think. Not Phil. Phil wants his players thinking and questioning, exploring their own inner selves so much. And he hits on this again and again. And he, he really challenges his players, asks them thought-provoking questions, and makes them explore themselves. Phil really does possess a wide array of mental powers and remarkably persuasive uh, to his players. And Phil was great at defining roles and having people face up to what the hierarchy is. So we're going to round this out here in a few minutes, but I really wanted to, to hit on again just the aspects that, that, learn, that Phil learned about quieting the mind. And he says, what I discovered playing for the Knicks is that when I got too excited mentally, it had a negative effect on my ability to stay focused under pressure. So I did the opposite. Instead of charging players up, I developed a number of strategies to help them quiet their minds and build awareness so they could go into battle poised and in control. I really enjoyed this element because when I was in high school, so I was playing lacrosse and what ended up happening is I would get so amped up. You want to talk about like being at 11. I, I was like, I was at like a 20. I was so revved up. And what I started to realize is I could still play well, but I couldn't tap into my truest talents. So I actually, before games, changed the music I was listening to and got into much calmer uh, music at the time. So I, I was big into like Jack Johnson in high school. So I would listen to Jack Johnson and the bus ride of the games and really just get into a more meditative Zen state. And I found that when I was kind of on that like peak state where I wasn't too revved up, but I wasn't asleep at all. I was just like that perfect equilibrium. That is when the best, or that's when my best would come out and Phil really tapped into this as well. And so what Phil talks about is the first thing he did with the Bulls was to teach the players an abbreviated version of mindfulness meditation based on a lot of his Zen practices. And so he says, I wasn't trying to turn the Bulls into Buddhist monks. I was interested in getting them to take a more mindful approach to the game and to their relationships one, with one another. At its heart, mindfulness is about being present in the moment as much as possible, not weighed down by thoughts of the past or the future, right? Like that's when we have errors in our elite performance, right? It's thinking, right? It's when we're thinking about the times we've missed, or we might look like an idiot when we miss. When we are in the moment, a quiet, simple, clear mind, our activity is strong and straightforward. But when we do something with a complicated mind in relation to other things or other people or society or activity becomes more complex. And so Phil says, what I discovered after years of meditation uh, is that when you immerse yourself fully in the moment, you start developing a much deeper awareness of what's going on right here, right now. And that awareness ultimately leads to a greater sense of oneness, the essence of teamwork. So at the end of this, I just say, go carve your own path. I think this was so clear in this distillation, just how much he carved his own path. And so I hope everyone feels somewhat inspired, empowered to take that, take their own path. 
So like I mentioned, you guys can, can get this entire written distillation at whatgotyouthere.com. You can also subscribe to our Momentum Monday newsletter, which is just a, a quick synthesis of everything I've been reading, listening to, articles, books, podcasts, and sharing them with you each week on Momentum, just to start your week off on the right foot. And then once a month, I come out with the distillation. Like I mentioned, we've done people such as Bruce Lee, Josh Waitskin, uh, investor Yen Liao, uh, Nick Konis, the, the legendary restaurateur. And so this is a really fun way to dive into the thinking, the inner game, the, the mindsets, the frameworks, the strategies of someone I've learned from and have deep respect for. Our. And so Phil is one of those people. And so I hope you guys enjoyed this. Remember, you can head to whatgotyouthere.com. If you're listening to the audio, you can also go to our What Got You There podcast YouTube page, and you can watch the entire video of this. So until next time, I hope you guys enjoyed. And remember, go carb your own path. And I want to thank you for watching another powerful episode of the What Got You There podcast. We drop new episodes every single Sunday. So if you subscribe to the page, you'll be the first one to see these powerful episodes. Remember, we deconstruct world-class performers to understand their strategy, tactics, and the routines they've used to help them become world-class in what they do. So if you want to understand and then implement these into your own life, you're going to want to subscribe to the page. Remember, we also put out a weekly newsletter called Momentum Monday, which is just a quick synthesis of everything I've been reading, listening to, and watching behind the scenes. You can stay up to date and follow everything we're doing at whatgotyouthere.com. What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there?